Howdy. Today we're going to be reading The Wife of Bath's Tale. Um, I'm still using the Harvard University interlinear translation if you want to read along. Um, now we're not going to read the prologue because as you might can see it is quite long. It goes from line one all the way to line 856 or something. Yeah, so if you would like to read all 856 lines of the prologue, it's quite good. Um, she talks about her philosophy on marriage and virginity, and she talks about all five of her husbands and um, things like that. If you would like to read it, by all means, enjoy. But we're just going to focus on the tale itself. And the test will not have any questions from the prologue, uh, just the uh, tale. The Wife of Bath's Tale is quite good, in my own opinion. If I was the host and I was awarding the prize for the best tale, I think the prize would go to The Wife of Bath, um, just based off of the ones that Chaucer was able to complete, either that or Sir Topaz. Anyway, um, here's the tale. In the days of in the old days of King Arthur, of whom Britain speak great honor, this land was all filled full of supernatural creatures. The elf queen, with her jolly company, danced very often in many a green mead. This was the old belief, as I read. I speak of many hundreds year, hundreds, hundred years ago, but now no man can see any more elves, for now the great charity and prayers of licensed beggars and other holy friars that overrun every land and every stream as thick as specks of dust in the sunbeam. Blessing halls, chambers, kitchens, bedrooms, cities, towns, castles, high towers, villages, barns, stables, and dairies. This makes it that there are no fairies. For where an elf was accustomed to walk, there walks now the licensed begging friar himself. In late mornings and in early mornings, and says his mornings and his holy things as he goes in his assigned district, Women may go safely up and down in every bush and under every tree. There is no other evil spirit but he, and he will not do them any harm except dishonor. So in case you hadn't picked up on it, the wife of Bath is, similar to Chaucer, critical of the clergy. She does not like friars. And so it happened that this King Arthur had in his house a lusty bachelor that on one day came riding from hawking. And it happened that alone as he was born, he saw a maiden walking before him, of which maiden straightway, despite all she could do, by utter force he took away her maidenhead. Her maidenhead is her virginity. So he, the knight rapes a young virgin. For which wrong was such clamor and such demand for justice unto King Arthur? that this knight was condemned to be dead by course of law and should have lost his head. Perhaps such was the statute then, except that the queen and other ladies as well so long prayed the king for grace until he granted him his life right there and gave him to the queen all at her will to choose whether she would save him or put to death. The queen thanks the king with all her might, and after this she spoke thus to the knight. When she saw her time upon a day, Thou standest yet, she said, in such condition, that of thy life yet thou hast no assurance. I grant thee life, if thou canst tell me what thing it is that women most desire. Beware, and keep thy neckbone from iron. And if thou canst not tell it right now, Yet I will give thee leave to go a twelfth month and a day to seek to learn a satisfactory answer in this matter. And I will have before thou go a pledge to surrender the body in this place. Okay, so Queen Guinevere, King Arthur's wife, says that the knight who has committed rape can save himself. He will get a year and a day to find out what women most desire. If he can find out the answer to her question, 
then he will be spared his life. If he cannot find out the answer to her question, he will be beheaded. Woe was this knight, and sorrowfully he sighs. But what? He can do no, he cannot do all as he pleases. And at the last he chose to leave, and come again exactly at the year's end, with such answer as God would provide him, and take his leave and go forth on his way. He seeks every house and every place where he hopes to have the luck to learn that what thing women love most. But he could not arrive in any region where he might find in this matter two creatures agreeing together. Some said women love riches best. Some said honor. Some said gaiety. Some rich clothing. Some said lust in bed. And frequently to be widow and wedded. Some said that our hearts are more eased when we are flattered and pleased. He goes very near the truth, I will not lie. A man shall win us best with flattery, and with attentions and with solicitude we are caught every one of us. And some say that we love best to be free and do just as we please, and that no man reprove us for our vices, but say that we are wise and not at all silly. For truly there is not one of us all if any one will scratch us on the sore spot, that we will not kick back because he tells us the truth. Try it, and whoever so does shall find it true. For be we never so vicious within, we want to be considered wise and clean of sin. And some say that we have great delight to be considered steadfast and also able to keep a secret. And in one purpose steadfastly to remain and not reveal things that men tell us. But that tale is not worth a rake handle. By God, we women can hide nothing. Here she he, she kind of goes off on a tangent about whether or not women can keep secrets. He tells us she puts a story inside of her story inside of the story. Witness on Midas. Will you hear the tale? Ovid, among other small matters, said Midas had under his long hair two asses' ears growing upon his head the which vice he hid as he could um, best could very skillfully from every man's sight, that except for his wife there knew of it no others. He loved her most and trusted her also. He prayed her that no to no creature she should tell of his disfigurement. She swore him nay for all this world to win. She would not do that dishonor of sin to make her husband have so foul a reputation. She would not tell it for her own shame, but nonetheless she thought that she would die if she should hide a secret for so long. She thought it swelled so sore about her heart that necessarily some word must escape her. And since she dared tell it to no man, she ran down to a marsh close by, until she came there at her heart was a fire. And as a bittern bubble bumbles in the mire, she laid her mouth down unto the water. Betray me not, thou water, with thy sound, she said. To thee I tell it, and no others. My husband has two long ass's ears. Ah, <sighs> now is my heart all whole. Now is it out. I could no longer keep it without doubt. Here you may see, though we a time abide, yet out it must come. We can hide no secret. The remnant of the tale, if you will hear, read Ovid, and there you may learn it. I don't know if you're familiar with the myth, but yeah, Midas was punished by Apollo and given donkey ears. And um, when his, when Midas's wife whispers it to the water, the reeds growing in the water heard it. So when the wind would blow through the reeds, the reeds would whisper, Midas has ass's ears. Midas has ass's ears. And so the secret got out. But that's uh, just a little side note. I don't think women most desire the reputation for being able to keep a secret. Moving on. Back to the knight. This knight of whom my tale is in particular, when he saw he might not come to that, this is to say what women love most, within his breast very sorrowful was the spirit. But home he goes, he could not linger. The day was come that homeward he must turn. 
and in his way he happened to ride in all his care near a forest side, where he saw upon a dance go ladies four and twenty and yet more, toward the which dance he drew very eagerly, in hope that he should learn some wisdom. But certainly, before he came fully there, vanished was this dance, he knew not where. He saw no creature that bore life, save on the green he saw sitting a woman. There can no man imagine an uglier creature. At the night's coming, this old wife did rise, and said, Sir Knight, there lies no road out of here. Tell me what you seek by your faith. Perhaps it may be the better. These old folk know many things, she said. My dear mother, said this knight, certainly I am as good as dead, unless I can say what thing it is that women most desire. If you could teach me, I would well repay you. Pledge me thy word here in my hand, she said. The next thing that I require of thee, thou shalt do it, if it lies in thy power, and I will tell it to you before it is night. Have here my pledged word, said the knight. I agree. Then, she said, I dare we, I dare me well boast, thy life is safe, for I will stand thereby. Upon my life the queen will say as I, Let's see which is the proudest of them all, that wears a kerchief or a hairnet, that dare say nay of what I shall teach thee. Let us go forth without longer speech. Then, <clears throat> Then she whispered a message in his ear, and commanded him to be glad and have no fear. When they are come to the court this night, said he had held his day, as he had promised. And his answer was ready, as he said, Very many a noble wife, and many a maid, and many a widow, because they are wise. The queen herself, sitting as a justice, are assembled to hear his answer. And afterward this night was commanded to appear. Silence was commanded to every person, and and that the knight should tell in open court what thing it is that worldly women love best. This knight stood not silent as does a beast, but to his question straightway answered, with manly voice, so that all the court heard it. My liege lady, without exception, he said, women desire to have sovereignty as well over her husband as her love and to be in mastery above him. This is your greatest desire. Though you kill me, do as you please. I am here subject to your will. In all the court there was not wife, nor maid, nor widow that denied what he said, but said that he was worthy to have his life. And with that word up sprang the old woman whom the knight saw sitting on the green. Mercy, she said. My sovereign lady queen, before your court departs, do me justice. I taught this answer to the knight, for which he pledged me his word there. The first thing that I would ask of him, he would do, if it lay in his power. Before the court, then, I pray thee, sir knight, said she, that thou take me as thy wife. For well thou know that I have saved thy life. If I say false, say nay, upon my, thy faith. Wow. So I'm going to stop reading there. We're at line 1057. And let's go back and talk about the answer. Okay. Uh, sh what is it a woman most desires? Women desire to have sovereignty over her husband as her lover. Now, what does that even mean? Because it, it's kind of worded funny, and we don't want to interpret this the wrong way because we want, you know, everyone to be happy. Women most desire sovereignty. That means rule. She wants to be able to rule as well over her husband as her love. Okay, think about what that means. Does that mean that women want a husband and then like another guy that they can that they can have on the side? I don't think that's what. Uh, I don't think that's what the, the old woman is meaning. Think about it some more. Um, okay, I think I figured it out. Have you figured it out? I'm not going to tell you until the beginning of the next video.
Till then.